the Royal Blue Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to the Agenda Podcast. I'm Ian Kroll and I'm joined by Connor O'Neill and I must apologise on Connor's behalf who has been AWOL from the podcast for the past couple of weeks. Not, not AWOL, working hard. Working hard, is that yeah, what it is? Working hard, yeah. Well, you're some, our back. Some of us have got to work hard, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> you're, you're our back on your day off as well. I am back on my day off, yeah, which, you know, shows commitments where what was probably lacking from Everton's team, I think the type of commitments on Sunday, what we all saw. If Everton's players only had your commitments... That's it. Well, you are back on your day off, so uh, much appreciated for coming in. We did promise the listeners that the Agenda podcast uh, would be recorded this week. Um, so, yeah, this is the Agenda podcast. This is the podcast where you send in the questions, you set the agenda. Got plenty of questions submitted via social media. I'll start the first one off, Connor, and it's from Anthony Roberts, who asks, Andre Gomez, have we rushed him back too early? Um, it, it's a tough one that isn't it because you would imagine that there would have been a lot of medical checks and stuff that would have been I don't think it's a case of like you know the old old fashioned days where the manager says to play you know can you run you're okay please do if you know and you can't back and you, you do imagine there's a lot of sports science behind it and stuff like that I must confess he looked absolutely knackered on Sunday he looked you know I don't know whether that was mostly with the fact that he'd basically been playing in midfield by himself <laughs> against, you know, a good team and, and was up against the young kid who was just rah, rah, it wasn't even like Billy Gilmore from the from the first minute. So I don't know whether it was a mixture of, of both in some respects in that he was up against you know, up against it in the middle of the park, yeah. coming back. Um but I think only the next couple of weeks will tell whether we've we've rushed him back. Um because the games will come thick and fast and you know the opponents don't get don't get any easier to do this. So only time will tell, but I can't see it being a case of well, we we've indefinitely rushed them back. I think that's I think that's a bit wide of the mark because, you know, even results prior to his, you know, his return to the team have been okay. You know, we we, we had one game of football that wasn't like we were solely reliant on, you know, him coming in to rescue the rest of our season. So no, I, I don't think I don't think we have rushed him back. I just think he, he looked a bit fatigued, a bit tired. But like I say, you know, there's there's numerous reasons as to why he looked fatigued. On Sunday, and you know the injury probably was one, you know catching up with him, and you know kind of there wasn't really much adrenaline. I don't think probably running through his body, or you know not like the Man United game where it, you know it was fast paced. And the second half we were right on the front foot eh, for large periods. We were on the back foot for, for most well for pretty much all of the ninety minutes on on Sunday Stamford Bridge. So I think it was a multitude of things. Really, I don't think we don't even really say we rushed him back. But only time will tell in terms of his, his actual fitness and how, how fit he is and, and how far he's still got to go. I mean, you, you got to look at Seamus Coleman, if you remember when he first came back after his leg break. And you remember that game against Leicester where he was just like the running machine, wasn't he? He was absolutely superb and yeah. put a lot of people to shame that night. But then suffered a dip a couple of weeks later. And Gomez probably will do the same, but that's to be expected. You know, he's, he's come back from a horrific leg break. He's been on the sidelines for a long period of time. So hopefully. You know he'll get back to fit and firing, and he he won't be playing central midfield by himself, which he was for large parts on Sunday. I mean, the main positive, I suppose, you could take from it, um, in terms of him coming back too early, is that he hasn't picked up another injury. No, that suggests if he had picked up some sort of injury, you would you could then you know you've got evidence to say well he has been rushed back there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, touch wood, he, he doesn't pick up any of them injuries. And you know, I think we've got two more games now, maybe before two weeks. The two week international it's insane, break. isn't it? Yeah. So Norwich now or no? no Norwich of game. course, yeah. Norwich has, has been cancelled due to the FA Cup. So I think it's one now, isn't it? I think one game then the, int- yeah, the international Liverpool. break yeah. kicks in. Um, well, the uh, international, yeah. international break. So you know, he's, he's, he'll get some time to recoup there and, and, and go again. You, you imagine? Okay, Anthony. I hope that answers your question. Next one. Uh, Sol B asks. What do you make of Rooney's upset at leaving Everton and repeating it numerous times, given the fans' upset at the first time? Good question. This this was submitted. Um, we haven't got the surname of Sol, so it is Sol B, but this was submitted last week and I, I promised him on Twitter that it would be included in the Agenda podcast. Um, I think obviously it refers to Rooney's comments um, before the, the FA Cup game, yeah, wasn't it, with Manchester but, but, United? Yeah. I can't remember who, he, who it was with, um, but he definitely made the comments and saying he was kind of forced out of Everton. Um, it is what it is, isn't it? You know, it, it was a bit of a fairy tale, Rooney coming back to the club when he did, and okay, it it it, it wasn't terrible, but it 
it probably didn't work out in terms of how we all wanted it to work mm-hmm. out. And unfortunately, it was on mega money at the time um, when he joined. You know, and I, I think he took a pay cut from United to come to Everton, but it was still still mega money. And we needed to get rid of, you know, or reduce the wage bill. And with his age and stuff like that, I just think it was, unfortunately, it wasn't a, a match made in heaven, was it really? We We... We wanted it to work and it didn't. And he obviously feels a little bit aggrieved by it, but the fans were aggrieved at the time when he when he left us all them years ago. And it was the right decision for Rooney to leave for his career because Everton were going nowhere at the time. They were certainly not going to be challenging for honours like the United team that he played for did. He's gone and you know earned his money with United, mega money. He's gone and achieved huge success in the game, won huge amounts of trophies. And he's, he, he came back in the hope that we could potentially... You know, challenge for the top four, win a trophy, and unfortunately, it didn't work out like that. And probably deep down, he's probably just gutted that he hasn't been able to to win something with Everton. That's probably all it is, I think. I mean, I, I actually, I always had a, a bit of a, a a different view to a lot of Evertonians on this because the first time round, as a young 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 kids when Rooney first left the first yeah. time, because it, it was a long time ago. People, we do forget how long ago it was. Know. You know what I mean? It was it, as a young kids who idolised Wayne Rooney and yeah. was obsessed with him. I was feeling I was devastated at the time, but on reflection now, like you said, you can't knock him for leaving. And also, you know, the, the money that he brought into the club by leaving. And I think, you know, I think he earned an extra five million for the, for the club because the bonuses that were put into his, his deal when he first joined United, I think he achieved every one because United won the European Cup. Yeah. So, and I actually think on his return, he was a little bit hard done to. Yeah. I think he was certainly signed... In that season where he showed class, I mean, you will remember the, the West Ham hat trick. He scored, I think, 12 goals that season, did he? I think he's, so. He, he did produce. Um, I don't think he was by no means the worst. I think he just got a little bit hung out to dry because of his, his, wage, his wages more yeah. than anything. Um, and his age, probably, as well. Yeah, I think if I he think, was a bit younger, he would still be there despite the wages. Yeah, and I think, you know, he, he's obviously agreed, he's, he's obviously right to be aggrieved, isn't he? Because... You know, at the end of the day, it was his dream. His, his dream didn't quite work out the way it did. And, and we, he's back now. He's done a bit spell in the States, didn't he? And he's been, obviously, with, he's with Derby comes now. But I think deep down, we all know he would have wanted to end his career at Everton, do the three years or whatever he, he was open to do, kind of sail off into the sunset. But, you know, it, it wasn't to be for him. Absolutely. Um, next question then from Matthew Barry. A lot of these next couple of questions, by the way, are transfer-related, so some of them kind of intertwine um, with others but obviously like we say you've submitted the questions so we will try and um, answer them as, as best we can so the next one from Matthew Barry regular submitted of a question and um, one time appear on the, the View From The God Street podcast Matthew asks out of the current squad Connor which players won't we be able to find buyers for in the summer I mean take your pick that, that's a real difficult one isn't it because there's 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 always clubs who come in for players and you, you're baffled why and one do you have got anything someone will come in for them and they never do. So I don't I don't think we can be can name names because you just don't know. Um I think you you're probably gonna sorry to interrupt, but you, you could probably say about ten players on in that squad, just off the top of my head, ten players you would suggest won't be there next season, but Again, it's fine in the clubs. It's then then players who are on higher wages because well, those that, clubs that, won't match it. I think that's the big that's the big issue, isn't it? I don't think it's as much we won't find buyers. I think then players have got lucrative deals. You know, they're on high money. Will they get that money elsewhere? It's the, it's probably highly unlikely. So I, I think you, you can't really name it, and you can't name this because you don't know what every manager and every club has a different recruitment policy. Don't they? you know? Every manager will look for something different. You know, there's nothing to say someone who comes up in the from the championship might take a point on Guilfrey Sigurdsson but yeah he would probably be one of the first people who many Evertonians would put on that list and say well no one's going to want to buy him you know, he, he's useless type thing so we just don't know do we he can't everyone's different and I mean you know you look at like you know you look at someone like Kuko Martin and people like that we've all laughed and said oh no one ever no one ever come in for him yeah club have he has people have come in for him you know yeah. what I mean and there's, yeah, there's other players there who you think well no one will come in for him if someone, someone will come in for him, sorry, and they never do. You know, it's you know, even new man, Ash, you know, he, he had deals from was it Forest and Leicester, uh, Leeds United, sorry, supposedly on the table in January and opted against it. But yet, you would never have imagined in a million years that 
given what we've seen of him on the ass, that two high level championship clubs like Forest and Leeds are mm. would be interested. So yeah. you you just don't know. And I think you can't really name players because you don't know what each club is individually looking for and what 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 their recruitment policy is going to be. Definitely a tough question to to answer there, like. I mean, obviously you have to, you know, on Sunday when the whistle goes for full time, you probably want to 11, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Any one of those could be out, <laughs> yeah. out the door, really. Here, the next question from Callum Lapsley and Tom Weston. How many players do we drastically need to challenge for Europe top four next season and what position do we need to be filled? Three realistic transfer targets should be prioritised. Yeah, just that, that question here. Callum and Tom kind of um, touched upon each other's questions, so um, I kind of combined it into one. I mean, realistically is obviously the key words. I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, go out in the transfer market and completely, you know, mm. change that squad, uh, or at least that first 11. You know, you're looking at probably three, four incomings, um, and then you're looking at, like, Deadwood, trying to get get rid of the dead wood. But the, the issue that w- that we've got is that the dead wood that, that you're looking at in terms of likes of, say, Tosin and Snardlin and... Two well, that's, Tosin's probably going to be going nowhere, is he? Well, that's what I mean. His, his, his injury. That's and... what I mean. He's injured now, Snardlin's injured. But they're the players who were considered dead wood. They didn't even feature on, on mm. say, Sunday. But, but, sorry, just to cut in, but no, on, on the flip side, like, you, you do look at, like, Snardlin in, in recent performances you know, against Crystal Palace. Mm. Um it's Chelsea and Ferguson's first game where he was, he was brilliant. And if anything, he probably suits that 4 4 2 midfield role best than most others because he can naturally sit there. Who's this, sorry? S- uh, Schneidlin. You Schneidlin. Know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so you know, it, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because on that current form of the Palace and the, the Chelsea game, he'd actually say Morgan Schneidlin's not only got a future at the club, but he could be pushing for a regular starting place. And it's a tough one. Obviously, certain players sit. You know, suits certain styles, and Morgan Snyder and I completely agree with you. Definitely, kind of suits a four-four-two, so where he can sit and you know hold, and he is a good passer of the ball. You know, no doubt about that. But I think he doesn't, you know, really offer too much going forward. He just, he, he just likes to sit. He's got one year left on his deal, has he? After after this season, possibly. Yeah, depends how you know how quick he can come back from this injury and whether Angelotti actually sees him as a, an integral part of the team. I don't think he will be seen as an integral part of the team. It'll be squad player at best. Mm-hmm. Will he see out his contract and keep earning the wages that he's on and then you know go and get another lucrative deal somewhere else? Probably his last last deal because he's not going to get a top mm-hmm. six side. Might go back to France potentially. Um, we've kind of moved away from the question there. But in terms of I, I, how many players do we, do we need? I, I, I think... You know, you, realistically, I think it's probably three or four top top players that that we need at least to challenge for the top six mm. because you know the top six of all lads, you know, minus you know Liverpool and probably City of all lads, bad seasons really. They're, they're not going to be this bad again, and they're, well, they're, they're all going to strengthen, aren't they? You know that that's what we're up against, isn't it? Effectively, you know, the big thing for me is you know a realistic, you know. We don't know, do we, what, what is realistic because we don't know what money's going to be available to Carlo Ancelotti. We don't mm. know, you know, what approach we're going to make. Financial fair play as well. Of course, yeah. And I think as well, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's personal opinion, isn't it? Because, you know, there's, there's people out there who will say we need a goalkeeper. Jordan Pickford's not good enough. There'll be other people who say, well, actually, you no, know, Jordan Pickford's the best goalkeeper that we've got available at the minute. You know, we'd be mad to let him go because we're not going to get anyone better for the position that we're in. So I think it, for me, it's just, it is really like... It's almost like personal opinion. And I think until we really know what the club's kind of financial aspirations are in terms of how much they're willing to spend, mm. how much, you know, they're willing to kind of put on the table and go for it, we, we you can't really say what is realistic, can you? Because for all we know, we, you know, Farah Mashiri could be plotting a £100 million pounds for the top centre forward who he's going to give 250 grand a week to, which... Then realistically, it changes the whole perfection of the type of forward you 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 expect us to target, wouldn't you? But I think until we know that, it, it's 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 hard. But one thing is for certain, there's there's no getting away that we we do need improving, and even you know next year it's going to be almighty tough to get the, to break the top six again, because you just cannot, you know, you you one imagines Liverpool no bad looks for could get Timo Werner, which mm-hmm. you know you think of how good their firepower is already. City, you, you, you kind of but expect wholesale changes um, in, in key areas. 
United will probably go out and strengthen again. Arsenal, Chelsea will, will probably strengthen again. Spurs, Marino, but he'll definitely be looking to spend money, you know. So you're up against it, aren't you? Because you know, it's not just this. They're not going to be walking in with this type of squad. Mm. They're going to be coming in with a new fresh bunch of players ready to go in. And that's what we're up against if we are going to, you know, break the strongholds of the traditional top six, top four. We haven't even taken into account keeping all of our better players, uh, uh, i.e. Uh, Charleston. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I know, you know, again, the cynical Evertonian in you, you know, all they've, they've signed new deals and stuff like that. Yeah. We've seen in football too many times before. Doesn't I mean, anything, it just doesn't mean anything, does it, you know? Um, next question is from Ben Crawford, which kind of is the we've kind of answered that. Ben, who has appeared on the View from Gallery Street this week, has just asked how many transfers do you expect this summer, and how would how many would be needed to achieve Carlo's ambition? So I think we've kind of yeah. touched upon that. So next question from Rob Brownlow: Given how slow our midfield looks, with Gilfie being a passenger, what would you do to shore up the midfield while we wait for the transfer window? So obviously in the in the immediacy. Well, there's, there's not much we can do, is because like, like we alluded to today, you know, Morgan Schneiderland's obviously out injured and I think, you know, he, he probably played a big part in the middle of the field. Mm. Um, Delft injured, is he? Well, Delft was on the bench, I think, the weekend, mm. was he? So, but again, he's kind of not really made a, a mark, has he? I don't think under Carol Lancia, what's he? Fabian Delft, he's been in and out, hasn't he? He's not, he's not really nailed down a place. I think there's, there's, there's nothing really we can do apart from just see how it goes and, and try and manage the best we can, you know. It's a, it's a really good question, it's one which I kind of was thinking about before we came on here, and the only way you shoehorn and Gilfie Sigurdsson, when it, you're not really shoehorning them in this way, but you, the only way you're getting Gilfie in this team is by playing a 3-5-2. But then it'll come on to the next question from um, Chris Voigt, who talks about not playing Sidibe, um for the Derby on Monday, but... Basically, what I mean is, if we play a three-five-two, you've obviously got your three centre backs. You'll have your your full backs as you 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 know your wing backs mm. essentially, and then you'll have your three centre midfielders. And if Sigurdsson's going to be in that team, it's with Gomez, another player, and then Sigurdsson, who could then potentially play as a number ten. That's the only way for me that it works because he, he can't really play in a four-four-two. He's not the type of snide and player, and he's been played left side of the midfield he's played right side of the midfield and quite clearly that's not working so mm. the only way of getting around that is by playing a 3-5-2 but then you've got to play probably Sadibi. and Chris Voigt in the next question doesn't want us to play Sadibi in the derby so I don't know how you get around it well, that's the thing isn't it it's the million dollar question and, you know unfortunately at the minute we've just got to deal with the, the hand we've been dealt with and it's as simple as that and I think going into Chris's question about you know can you play Sadibi if Seamus is out well, we've got very little option but not to play City. I mean, it is a worry playing City because we've seen against the top size this season. He struggles. I mean, defensively, he's completely inept. You know, you, you look at the, the the derby back in December when he was hauled off after it was it thirty four minutes because Sadio Mane just absolutely destroyed him every time he got the ball. And he, he could not get near him. Yeah. I mean, I um, felt sorry for him, and that that was all down to Marco Silva's tactics. It so. was, but no, what I think what's not helped City by since then is that. That's not proved to be one isolated instance. No, it's not. No, he's he struggled. Was it Manchester? He struggled against Arsenal. You know, he struggled against Chelsea. It's, it's not. It, unfortunately for him, it's not that one sole game, is it? Where you can kind no. of go, oh, well, you know, he wasn't by the manager. That there's been, you know, other signs of that this season. Um, so I think you know answering Chris, Chris's question in the same manner. There's nothing we can do because you just dealt with the the hand you played, but aren't you? He's only looked good, Sadibi, when he's played kind of right wing, mm. and he's had Coleman. As the right back, you know, you look at the he's had one or two assists, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. so that's what I mean. He, everyone says, Oh, he, he looks good going forward, but it's when he's had no cover, it's one on one defensively, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, you know. he's been poor. But even even some of the you know, on Sunday afternoon, I felt like he was some of his passes went astray, he, yeah. simple, easy passes, and controlling of the ball as well. It can't, whether that's just down to you know, concentration, it, I think it's now becoming quite apparent why Monaco. Will be quite happily mm. accept twelve million pound for him. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one. I don't want to like go in on him and like be slagging him off because I'm not. I think he's been, I think he's been solid up to a point. I think the derby obviously was a was a low point of the season for him, and it's kind of just you know. Well, I think, I think it goes back to things to, to, to the, the questions early and stuff, and that you're almost you know we're talking about ways to improve, ways to break the top six, break the top four eventually. 
ways to you know want more move forward, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. His having to debate full fullback the way to move forward. Because I think we've seen this year is yeah, he's good to a certain point, but he's probably not good enough to take us to that next level and not good enough, you know. You, you look at someone like, you know, Aaron Wambasaka, for instance, at, at, you know, Man United, absolutely had still in his back pocket on Sunday. Mm. You know, one on one defensively was absolutely outstanding. Didn't don't get he got beat once by Sterling all afternoon. And that's it's the type style and I thought. But I know, but that's the type of the, that's the type of defender you need in them big no, games yeah, yeah. when it matters most and you're going for the top prizes. You need that one on one individual battle. You need to win. City Bay's not won enough of them this year in the big games when it's mattered most. And if anything has really struggled in other aspects of the game. He's not mobile enough to be a, so a, a, you know a, a, a back and forth full back. If you yeah. if you look at the best right backs in the Premier League in terms of Trent Alexander Arnold and like one of the, um, Adam Wan Basaka, they they're not huge. Um, they're quite don't the built, but they're, they're quite skinny as well, and they can get back and forth yeah. up and down the field quite easily. And they're very very mobile. He's not he's not like that at all. Okay, the next question from Leon Pearson. I'm dead serious. I think Gilfie has a play or pay contract. I.e., if he's available, he doesn't play. F- Play the club, it's penalised in some way. There is no way he's in our best 11. Why does he play every week? Well, I think, I think. <laughs> Obviously, a bit of tongue in cheek from Leon. I don't, I don't think he is on a play or pay contract. I just think yeah, very little other options at the moment. I, I agree, Carlo probably shouldn't be trying to shoehorn him in, in, the, in the side in terms of left side and right side. Um, he's taken a, a lot of flack, isn't he, at the moment? And Probably a little bit justified, but again, he's being asked to do something that is not dance. That is not his strength, is it? No. It's it's a difficult one. I, I, I don't want to be slagging players off because I know he, he's taken a lot on social media from fans, and I think we it's all this and buts. But if he'd scored that goal against United last week, we'd all be probably thinking we love we'd be loving Gilfie because mm. we were the one two one against United. Okay, didn't happen, and he's had he's gone. Not just him; the whole team has had a poor game against Chelsea. So, if you're going to pick on Gilfie, you need to pick on everyone else. Really. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Stephen Grady, um, a New Zealand fan here. Should I bother getting up at three a.m. in New Zealand to watch this dross? Well, Stephen, I've got one message for you, mate. Keep the faith. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Keep the faith. Set that alarm for two forty-five, fifteen minutes to. Get yourself awake. Three o'clock, three a.m. kickoff in New Zealand. Keep the faith. Let's do it. Derby match next. <laughs> like what we're saying after the derby. Don't blame us for the <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. You need. You probably need your be- uh, beauty sleep. Uh, Carl Bloxman asks, "Why can't we just be average all season? I can't take these ups and downs." Also, Chris Wood got another one against Spurs. He did. What a what a player this Chris Woods turned out to be. <laughs> um, Carl, what can I say? Um, in terms of being average all season, we've been we haven't just been average all season. We've been average for the past twenty twenty five <laughs> years. So I think it's uh, we're just used to it now. I, I agree in terms of the ups and downs, but we sometimes I think Everton fans do get themselves let themselves get a bit carried yeah. away in terms of expectation. Obviously, since Carlos come, it's it's certainly been at, um, certainly been better since Silver's Day. We've picked up points, we've scored goals, and the defense kind of has been a little bit solid. Um, I think I mentioned it in the in the fan podcast this week. P- potentially the Wofford game papered over a few cracks mm-hmm. because after that game we kind of, you know, the momentum was there, and then we obviously we went into um, the Arsenal game, and we thought if we can win these, we're, we're, we're like slap bang in the fight for for European football. So the expectation had risen, and now it's just obviously um, it's gone. So. I don't want to just be average all season. Uh, I don't want to be up and down either. We obviously want to be challenging for top four. We want to be challenging for the league. We want to be challenging for trophies. I think, as we've just said with Stephen Grady there, we need to to keep the faith in Chris Wood. I still wouldn't target him as a as a player. Everton should be looking forward in the summer. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> and he's, he's, it's going to be to the point where Chris Wood scores like 30 goals in one season. It's like, well... Put, put your football knowledge to shame. It pro- probably will, yeah. <laughs> Next question from Rick Eckloff. What are your expectations over the rest of the season? Just try and pick as many points as we can, finish as high as we can. Yeah. Lay some foundations and building blocks for next season. That's I think that's all it can be, isn't it? You know. Yeah. That's Carlos obviously assessing each individual and you know, I'm sure behind the scenes he's doing a lot more than what's on the pitch as well. So Well, I think, you know, 
obviously we don't struggle the weekend and we have our games where we have struggled. But I think Carlo has made strides in, in the short time he's been here. I think, you know, I think you look at the way we attack, we, we get more bodies forward. It's just, I know them, you know, I mean, I've never seen a team fall by, you know, be on the wrong, be so against the kind of, the small margins of football. I mean, you know, you look at, you look at the weekend, you know, we barely touched the ball in 25 minutes, half an hour. Yeah, the first chance we get possession, we carve Chelsea right open and Dominic Carver Lewis should make it 2-1. Yeah, the ball, that changes the game. The ball rolls on time. You know, you're thinking there, if it goes 2-1, Chelsea, you know, you're probably thinking, bloody hell, we dominated here now, you know, Everton have got to go back from nothing. You know, small margins, Man United, Gilfie Sigurdsson, you know, if you put it two, two, three yards either side of the gate, it's probably a goal. Small margins, again, you know, it's... It, it, lately, we just, you know, he can't see he's always on the wrong side of the small margins of football. Yeah. So I think moving forward, you just got to put as many points on the board as we can, finish as high as we can and, and lay some solid foundations moving moving into next season. Yeah, it has been frustrating, but I, I completely agree with that. Ashley Stewart asks, my question is with financial fair play, how much will we have to spend on plays this season? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm not. Um, Everton's financial... Um, director or executive so it's it's completely up in the air isn't it i think you know we will be in the premier league this season so we'll have you know premier league you yeah. know, money and stuff like that so i don't think that's that's an issue um i, I don't think we're going to have any more than we've had over the past couple of seasons really unless we're going to be you know looking to you know get rid of a couple of assets really I, th I think we just need to be very very clever in who we're going for and the fact that we've got Carlo Ancelotti now as our manager, you know, you're hoping that he's going to be able to attract, you know, hidden gems really and players that might necessarily not have come mm. to, to Goodison in, in the first place. Financial fair play is obviously going to um, restrict us to, to an extent. I, I just hate financial fair play. I don't think it works. I just think it's, you know... That's a whole different show. That it is, it is. It's, it's, it's a ploy to, you know, get to keep the the big name teams at, at, at the top of a European football. Um but who knows, you know, Usnov might have in the in the near future anyway, some sort of say about how we uh, how we fund the club and hopefully it will uh, progress on from there. But yeah, I can't really answer that actually unfortunately because I don't know. But I think we will have money to spend in the summer. I just don't think it's gonna be, you know, in the hundreds of millions like most fans would would want. Next question from Tonda Groff. With nothing to play for, um, does Moise Keane get handed a much bigger run in the side for the rest of the season? Uh, it's a difficult one, it's because I, I think Phil Kirkbride, you know, the Liverpool Echoes Everton correspondent, he, he touched on it saying that it's a bit of a conundrum now for a Carl Ancelotti moving forward because whilst we kind of haven't got nothing to play for, if we're being realistic, being realistic and, and honest, you, you, you know, I think about. Do you still just put them in, or do you still do you let the the partnership between Richarlison and Dominic Calvert Lewin continue to blossom and continue and con let them continue to work together and mm. and improve? It's a real difficult one. I mean, I would like to see him give him a, a, a much more run in in the team because I think we've got to start to see something from somewhere moving forward. Um, but it's a real difficult one, and it's probably explained by Carlo Ancelotti. He's, Paid to be a football manager, and I'm not because I'm, I'm un really unsure to be honest. I, I can't make my mind up. I see pluses and negatives as to both reasons why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't. Yeah. Um, I think it depends, if I'm being honest, I think it depends what Carlo is thinking next year in terms of moving forward, whether he's prepared to sort of say, Well, actually, we're going to start the season with Calvert Lewin and Charleston up top, and they're going to be a partnership. Then, unfortunately, that probably means Moise Keane's not going to get much more of a look than what he has so far because why would you bother me, me messing around with something that is going to revert back to what it is next season? Um, if Carl and Chelsea looks at it in the way and thinks, well, actually, no, I, want to bring a for I want to bring a forward in, in the summer mm. and a Charles could possibly go back on the left, then, yeah, Moise Keane is certainly deserving of a, of a chance of moving forward. I think you've hit the nail on the head, certainly for, for the rest of this season at least. You know, the one positive to take from the past couple of months has been the partnership between Richarlison mm. and Dominic Carver-Lewin. So everything else has kind of just been, you know, 
bang average or less yeah. than bang average. So why why split up something that has has flourished in terms of Richarlison and Dominic Carver Lewin? If if that partnership or we weren't scoring goals, then I think there'd be more calls for Keane to to be getting in that side. You know, he, he came on against Chelsea on Sunday and okay, he's fighting a losing battle, but he did nothing. He didn't do absolutely anything. Mm. Um, I'm not slagging him for it. I just, you know, we didn't really make that much of an impact. But unfortunately for Moise Keane, Richarlison, Dominic Carver Lewin have, have played very well and been scoring goals. So you can't just you can't just throw him in. If Keane was a midfielder and wasn't getting a chance, then I'd be like, well, give him a chance over Sigurdsson. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just I just don't think you can split up that partnership at the moment between Keane and Dominic Car- um Richarlison and Dominic Carver Lewin. Okay, they didn't score on Sunday, but you know we got the opportunity. Dominic didn't take his chance, but mm. I think for the rest of the season, keep that partnership together and they, they will score goals. Keane potentially could come on and have some sort of an impact with 15, 20 minutes to go if we're still in a shout with getting a result. We weren't against Sunday, so on against Chelsea on Sunday, so it was kind of a, a, dead, a dead substitution. It was not on. It was just to give him some minutes, really, wasn't it, in my opinion? Well, it, it, it was, I mean, as a conversation with a mate of mine after the game, and and he was of the opinion that for the rest of the season, pretty much Mason Hargate should play central midfield away from home mm. because he was saying he, he's the only one who can go in there with a bit of defensive, a defensive mindset. Sit in front of the back four and not allow us to get play through the lines like we have been in recent weeks. But again, that goes back to the thing of, well, sure, it's not, it's not, it's not irrelevant because Hargate's now signed a new deal. He's probably going to be the, the mainstay centre after the rest of the club. So why move him? I'll start position into another position moving. It, it, but it's it's, it's all, needs must it's it needs must in terms yeah. of what what will work well because it has worked. Holgate in that yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. not I I know he's a central uh, defender and he will be a central defender for the rest of his career. But why not try it? Why not try that? Mm. But then, like the flip side, I just want to say, well, a keen, a mean and keen are too slow as a, as a yeah. back four, but they get not get caught. That. So it's all it's it's it's, it's, it's all cut with the should, isn't it? You know, with, you know, could we do this? Should we do this? It's Easy to sit here and say, isn't it? But to actually, you know, put it into practice on a football pitch is yeah. a lot harder. There's no easy answer to it, is there? Finally, from Ian Ferguson, do you think this Everton squad could cope with European football? Um, I think the squad, in terms of size, could cope with European football. I think we need to remember that this season, I was speaking about it actually with Phil Kirkbride um, before Everton's press conference on Friday, but the, the pre Chelsea. Um, match we've had so many injuries this season mm. unlucky injuries I, I can't remember a team or I don't know another team who's had so many long term injuries and, and niggling injuries so mm. I think squad wise I think Brands has, has actually come out and said anyway that he wants to reduce the size of the squad Yeah. so in terms of squad size without a doubt we should be able to cope with European football in terms of quality you know no, we we wouldn't be able to cope. We we might get through a group stage of a, a Europa League and then maybe get to through a knockout stage. But it's uh, I think in in terms of reference to that, it's probably quality and and numbers. Mm. Quality, no numbers, yes. I think unfortunately as well, Ian, and I don't mean to base your European football bubble, but I think it's irrelevant, really, isn't it? Now? Because <laughs> I, think, on, eh? I think we will. I think the 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 thing we need to look at now is building a squad next season to go in to challenge for Europe and then look at getting one like a cup with the demands of European football. Mm. Because I, I don't think this squad right now this minute is good enough to challenge for European football, let alone compete in the competition, if, if you know what I mean. So yeah. I think this the focus needs to be on players who could get us in them places to then look at and say, well, now we're in there, this is what we need to do to make sure that we're at the, you know, the quarter final, semi final, knocking on the door at them stages, not kind of Oh, we've got in the Europa League, and then after two games, going, oh, well, we're going to play a weekend team tonight because you know it's, it's, we've got a big game Sunday, and you know we've got a couple of knocks, or then, or then we, we do play a strong team on a Thursday, and then on the Sunday it's you know a weekend team, and we get beat like we've seen in the past. And it's well, you know we're struggling to cope with the demands of of Thursday Sunday football. So I think personally we need to get a squad first that can get us into them competitions because. Like we've seen this year, this squad's not even good enough to get us in the Europa League, let alone challenge for the Champions League. So we need to get a squad first that has got players in with real ability who can take us to the next level. And then we can start looking at saying, well, let's get one or two maybe squad fringe players who could easily fill fill the gaps type thing and, and, and be good enough to come in 
do a job and then and then potentially drop back out. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, good questions. Finish off. Well, before we do finish off the agenda podcast, the derby on Monday. Quick prediction from you, Connor. Um. One one. One one. Gone positive. I think I said we get be two one <laughs> in the day. The fan podcast this week, so I can't change that. One one. Are you going to be watching it? Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> I don't see why. <laughs> Even if Liverpool goes champions or win the league, potentially a chance of winning the league at Goodison. Well, we can just hope that Man City get the job done this Wednesday night and the weekend. Because um, I don't think anyone wants to. It's irrelevant either way. They're going to win the league, aren't they? Yeah. If you just don't want them winning it like that, we're still going to Goodison's year and them being crowned. I mean, probably, you know, you know in this long running saga that is, you know, Everton Football Club who tend to write their own chapters in, in history. It would just be another chapter in, in the in the recent, you know, only Everton. Yeah. Only Everton section, wouldn't it? So no, I think I think it'll be one one. I think I think we can be you know, get a point, I think. I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll be good enough to keep clean sheets, if, if I'm being honest, I think. But I, I think we could get at, we can get at them. So they haven't looked very good at the back even recent weeks. They've looked a little bit ropey. Um, and obviously they've got a massive game as well. Wednesday before having needs you know, being to see how what they do and how much that the game takes out because it's, it's absolutely huge. All right, Connor. Uh, thank you. Um, Gender Podcast is back and hopefully we'll be back soon on enough. A much, on a much more positive note next time around, eh? let's hope. Let's hope so. Um, you have been listening to the Agenda Podcast on the Royal Blue Podcast channel.